this. So this lecture will present some of the key concepts, contours and concerns of this young approach and young field. Um, and uh, it will also introduce uh, my new book, uh, which is forthcoming with Oxford University Press within a few weeks, actually, uh, Existential Media, uh, a Media Theory of the Limit Situation. And as my title here promises, um, temporality will play a role, because when I started thinking about uh, what to present to you, I thought about your focus on normativity, and I was thinking, can we, can time and digital time be normatively constituted? Um, and I will also set uh, digital time up against what I call existential time by introducing the concept of the limit situation into media theory and in turn by infusing the concept of waiting with existential meaning. And I will ultimately suggest as uh, Michaela said, that we need to slow down to find our bearings in order to move ahead. And importantly, this will also be a story of field failure, as well as field epiphany, that is failure as a researcher in my field, and how a different ethics and ethos for doing research and even a different concept perhaps of being human in the digital age altogether, emerged out of my own shortcomings. So this will therefore be a sharing of notes from the slow feed. And I ultimately propose an ethics, existential ethics of care as carefully attending and slowing down as an act of rebellion. Just to make this a bit exciting for you. So with this, um, this is the, the project I'm heading that Michaela mentioned, uh, Biome at Uppsala, and this is my research group. And this is what I'm working on right now. And today I will not, not be sharing a work in progress uh, from the project, but some key ideas that uh, bridge the old project that I did, that I did at Stockholm University and the, the new project are part of my book. But I will just say that the purpose of this project, and I mean, I, at some point, maybe uh, I can get back to you and share more from this new approach, um, is to investigate the existential possibilities and challenges, as well as ethical risks and imperatives, as our embodied existence and everyday life world become ever more entangled with biometrics, which is, as you know, face and voice recognition and sensory data capture. And the questions then, uh, that preoccupy us is what ethical issues and new digital human vulnerabilities may be brought on by this development. And I sense here are some affinities with your interests, of course. And this is uh, where you can find out more about us and the project and, and the uh, publications, etc. at the uh, hub. Okay, so this is the book. Existential media studies, then, um, I can perhaps try to summarize it in a nutshell. It revisits what it means to be human in all our diversity and in our common humanity in the digital age. And it remaps media, digital culture, AI in light of existential philosophies, key themes and concepts. Um, it reconceives of the media as an existential terrain that needs to be navigated and of media users as coexisting beings, as coexisters. And also it refigures media as existential media, introducing their suggested key properties and forms. Now, I will not be going into the case studies and the empirical work uh, so much. Uh, I will rather uh, stick to introducing some of the the definitions um, of these key properties and forms today. I don't really think I have the time. But just to bring you back to uh, the web 2.0 era, so to speak, 10 years ago or so, I made a discovery. Um, and as I said earlier, critical perspectives or perspectives that um, looked at the sort of um, uh, 
darker side of the internet were not that important in our field uh, or neglected even. So th there was this whole world of death and mourning online and media studies failed to recognize it. It was the sociology of death and human computer interaction that quickly turned to these phenomena. And as you can see, this is old. <laughs> these are old examples of, of uh, the presence of death online, but the live world seemed to be you know, pervaded by a return of death to everyday life, uh, at least in, in um, Northern Europe or in, in the Nordic countries, where death had been during modernity uh, severed from everyday life and, and uh, institutionalized in different ways. So here you had a whole world of mourning and commemorating the dead, lighting digital candles for the dead, etc. cetera. Uh, that was one discovery. And another discovery then was that media studies lacked also the concepts to deal with suffering and trauma and existential vulnerability in and with media. Um, so this was the pioneering project that I headed then in terms of introducing uh, or existentializing as it were, uh, media theory and media studies, uh, existential terrains. And with a particular but not exclusive focus on death online, our project set out to explore and gain detailed knowledge about how fundamental existential issues are pursued when people's lives and memories are increasingly shaped in, by, and through digital media forms. So the first uh, focus was on media, on people's media practices and existential explorations online. The other uh, area of interest had to do with those existential issues and challenges that we are facing due to digitalization. So the second focus had to do with uh, the technology and the first had to do with human practices. So um, um, existential media, um, so this, this was the first project I headed where this um, approach was formulated um, but uh, and as an outcome of that all the research activities and work but also international network activities conferences and a lot of outreach activities in Swedish society and also in a way bridging the old project and the new one uh, this book um, introduces existential media studies but also defines existential media through as I propose four properties. And I think, I think it is it's a good idea to start by defining, right? So first of all, um, media <laughs> are more than information, uh, entertainment, uh, politics or, or ec the economy. They are also part of what makes us human and they, they pervade the life world in different ways and our entire existence. Um, so, First then, I would argue that existential media ground us in being. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they are world makers and they uh, profoundly shape our life world, our everyday life. Um, and it, we can quote here John Durham Peters who argues in his The Marvelous Clouds that media are our infrastructures of being the habitats and materials through which we act and are. This gives them ecological, ethical, and existential import. So this pertains to the material or ontological dimension of media then. But secondly, and perhaps uh, uh, surprisingly, um, they also throw us up into the air, I argue. And this uh, rehearses some of the key concerns in critical media. Uh, sociology, for instance, that they expose us to technological, systemic, ideological, imaginary and symbolic power, thereby heightening our uncertainty or forging inequalities in our populations and lives. But it also implies that they embody through their profound yet utterly uncertain implications, the very uncertainty of being as becoming human with machines and also importantly within limits. So this pertains to the uncertainty of media. And the first property pertains to 
the sense in which media ground us. Thirdly then, they speak to and about our shared vulnerability and deep relationality. So they play important roles in our mundane quest for meaning or in the struggle with non-meaning uh, and in our attempts and failures to forge a common world in communication. So, and fourthly, they demand responsive and responsible action. And this really resonates with what Manfred was uh, saying earlier. So um, existential media are imperative and urgent. They demand our action, critique, ethical choice, perhaps, as you said, uh, uh, cultivation, uh, an ethics of care, perhaps sometimes even an either or. Maybe we don't have to automate everything just because we can. Uh, this is a, a really a question about values and priorities also. Yes. <clears throat> so media are habitual and banal, which is sort of the common coin today in media studies and media theory. But they're also existential, I argue, due to their significance during extraordinary transformative or traumatic events and crises that both transcend the everyday, remind us of, of our mortality, and importantly, traverse individual and global skills. Taking these transformations seriously means recognizing that in the quote, unbearable intimacy of emergency, as religious studies scholar Sam Mickey has put it, uh, alternate contours of what media can mean are also revealed. So we leave the kind of sanguine understanding of media that we often find in cultural studies. And uh, we, this, because this is a, a green project, right? Um, we turn to um, darker sides of, of, of life, but also uh, to situations uh, such as those defined by Carl Jaspers as limit situations. Um, so today we might argue that, our, or argue the world is on edge, right? Uh, and and it, we, we can call our time a li limit situation or a civilizational limit situation constituted by a series of entangled cataclysmic environmental, epidemiological, political, economic and technological crisis. So in my book, I'm drawing on and expanding on uh, upon Jasper's concept of the limit situation. And he defines this, of course, as encounters with death crisis, guilt, and conflict. And we might add birth and love uh, as limit situations, of course. Um, moments in life that can be transformative if we seize them as we face the limits of what we can control. Okay, so expanding on the limit situation. Um, Media technologies that sustain our everyday life play powerful roles in, in this situation then. Um, media are today where the limit situations of life are often played out. For example, in uh, online mourning communities and support groups for the bereaved or in therapeutic uh, or communities, etc. Uh, they constitute one might argue in themselves a limit situation. Um, and uh, in, the, in the sense, as I argued earlier, that they um, present us with a series of, of new ethical or perhaps renewed ethical predicaments. Uh, we have sometimes have to choose. And by extension, our present age of interrelated crisis in which technologies are fundamental can be named a digital limit situation. Um, in a limit situation, argued Jaspers, uh, humans are called upon both to sort of slow down, find their bearings, but also to act, uh, faced as they are with the most pressing questions concerning their values and priorities. And I want to exemplify because I thought, oops, what happened? Here we are. Um, I thought that this article by Naomi Klein uh, from May uh, to 2020, uh, when she was uh, 
identifying a kind of pandemic shock doctrine uh, that she was highly critical of in this uh, article in The Guardian. She, uh, she really uh, exemplifies what I'm after when I talk about how key questions need to be asked. Um, and of course, the entire pandemic uh, has made us all uh, return to such questions. And for her, the question is, Will that technology be subject to the disciplines of democracy and public oversight, or will it be rolled out in state of exception frenzy without asking critical questions that will shape our lives for decades to come? Questions such as these, for instance, if we are indeed seeing how critical digital connectivity is in times of crisis, should these networks and our data really be in the hands of private players such as Google, Amazon and Apple? If public funds are paying so much for it, of it, should the public also own and control it? If the internet is essential for so much in our lives, as it clearly is, should it be treated as a non-profit public utility? So these crystallized challenges ultimately open out, I argue in my book also, to a media theory of limit. Media are literally life-defining often. Um, and sometimes they seem to be involved in these limitless extractions and exploitation of humans uh, through uh, the rendering of our uh, behavior online to, uh, as data sold to third parties, etc. But they are not without limit. And they speak, media speak to and about limits in a variety of ways. The limit situation is chosen in my book as a privileged reality, which allows for bringing limits in all their shapes and forms onto the radar when we interrogate digital existence. And it of course also brings our attention to the fact that human existence itself, to state the obvious, is and has always been limited and precarious. And life is a life within limits. Our bodies are limited by their boundaries and they age and they decay, reminding us of their mortality and of evaporation, vulnerability and finitude. Hence, if technologies are us, as the post-humanist credo would have it, mediation cannot merely be a vital process. Existential media are also media of and within limits. And of course, the theory of, um, of uh, uh, finitude par excellence uh, is existential philosophy. And as much as its focus on death uh, must be thoroughly qualified, um, because many existentialists, as everyone knows, focused on death, I argue that there is still reason to keep finitude on the radar to highlight limit and vulnerability as a corrective to the figurations that invoke unbounded forces and endless possibilities. Furthermore, and those forces, of course, Silicon Valley <laughs> um, uh, voices. Furthermore, it is possible to situate limit as the very site of birth and rebirth, which is also an offering of Jasper's limit situation. Importantly, however, this is not to rehearse the claim that death overrides all other experiences or all other formative experiences in human existence. And also, of course, um, finitude must be stretched beyond the individual level as we stand on a brink uh, as a species on a fatigued planet. And in this vein, I ask in the book then, what if life and therefore media life belong to the limit from the outset and not to endless energies and abilities? And instead of seeing limit as an impairment and an absence pitted against an idealized perfection and movement, what if we see it as a way of being and a site of value? What if the margins of disability, grief and illness constitute privileged ways of seeing and knowing the world that may also bring other contours and neglected contours of media into sight? So to enter into these terrains, which I did in my work, I, I chose one margin that has the peculiar characteristic of sooner or later entailing all of us, mourning and struggling of human beings at the limit. And this as for, was my privileged side of the rethinking media and media theory. So placing those who are poised on the edge, the mourners, people with disabilities, people who are illness-stricken, disenfranchised, meek, marginalized, 
it, it really makes a difference to place them at the center of media studies. Um, so in my book, as Central Mourners who belong to NGOs with a strong presence online. Um, in other words, I was putting the circumnavigated and sidestepped human and vulnerable human body, which is existentialism's concrete and relational individual belonging to a concrete historical situation in the spotlight anew. And I name her the coexister. By making visible neglected aspects of being human as a potential for becoming human, she emerges as a deeply relational being who is stumbling and hurting, responsive and responsible, imbricated uh, in socio-technological ensembles and traversing these terrains uh, more or less successfully in search of, while never fully achieving what I cautiously call existential security. So I had really big plans to conduct long-term ethnographies in closed support groups uh, online. And I learned the hard way. Uh, as I entered into a room of 80 morning women and two men at an NGO meeting uh, in a hotel in a Swedish town of Eslöv in March of 2015, with the intention of presenting the project and asking uh, permission among the members uh, of the group to join their closed Facebook group, uh, a majority said no. We are human beings in grief, not a study object, they said to my face. And their wishes, <laughs> of course, became my command. And I also learned in this way that vulnerability is a very real thing, and I made them feel even more vulnerable. And I have termed this a slow field, which requires of the researcher that she make a range of methodological choices that in turn rely on and bring about a practical ethics. In fact, the existential terrains of connectivity force uh, the researcher to slow down and thereby also to problematize the norms of speed and quantity in data gathering in non-afflicted con contexts. Note also that failure, shortcoming, breakage is key to Jasper's philosophy of communication. Uh, and he sees the, the shortcoming as a source of fecundity, actually. And I will read, the sense of shortcoming in communication is thus an origin of the breakthrough to existence and of a philosophizing that tends to elucidate the breakthrough. As all philosophizing starts with wonder and as mundane knowledge starts with doubt, the elucidation of existence, existence starts with the experience of shortcoming in communication. And this I learned in my own um, embodied sense. Um, consequently, I worked slowly and consciously, patiently and with great sensitivity to establish contacts within the group. And after building trust, I was granted a very rare access to the field through individuals who we might uh, label powerhouses within their networks. And these methodological choices, as I said, um, they were imposed in a sense and then embraced willingly um, due to the fact that my ethical imperative was the mourner's well being and wishes. And this also means I have been working with individuals in a longitudinal manner, meeting them several times over several years. Um, I chose strategically to interview people with very deep experience and a wide network of contacts within the field of mourning online, which means that each voice also conveys a much broader register of experience than their single life story contains. And in this, I have been greatly inspired um, by uh, the virtue ethics approach uh, of Charles S. Uh, and um, I have tried to apply what he calls the good Samaritan approach. Um, and due to the highly sensitive nature of, of the uh, research topic, uh, informants have been approached with a high degree of uh, ethical consideration, sharing a letter of introduction, etc. Yes, perhaps I shouldn't go too deeply into the, the um, details of, of, of that, but uh, I would just say that uh, I, I um, 
have also been working to develop this existential ethics of care, both in the book, but also more lately in the new project. And I wanted to share with you today this paper because it was accepted for publication uh, last Friday. So uh, it, it will be out soon. And um, an eth existential ethics of care then beyond solutionism and these, the values canyon, canon that we see in, in the discussions on AI ethics, the lists of principles, we try to reframe the whole discussion by thinking that ethics is bodies and what is at stake for human beings as embodied beings in, uh, in this situation when biometrics uh, is uh, in more and more integrated into the human life world at airports, in our smartphones, etc., in our bedrooms with the uh, smart assist assistants listening in and uh, recording our voices, etc. So we wanted to bring several ethical projects into a conversation and collision in this paper, uh, which means that we bring in virtue ethics, post-humanist ethics, a feminist ethics of care, uh, while also reinventing some of the Kantian deontological ideals and principles. Uh, so it would be, I mean, this is a dangerous cocktail, but it would be interesting to hear actually your uh, reactions and reflections on this paper um, as soon as it's, it's, oh, well, I can actually share now if anyone's interested. Um, but anyway, so we have the, the virtue ethics approach uh, in combination with uh, uh, more post-humanist uh, sources of inspiration. Um, uh, yes, and as um, feminist philosophers and ethicists, such as uh, here we have Fisher and, and Toronto and later Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, they emphasize caring is as something that we do to sustain our world and maintain it. Um, ethics and ethics of care is about circulation through doing things practically rather than adhering to certain principles. Um, but I think that it would be exciting to see if we can combine uh, retaining a focus on moral intention uh, with an understanding of practical care work in more than human uh, webs of cares, as it were. Um, in the limit situation, I think that all these interrelated crises with severe consequences for our survival, I think the world and the planet are screaming to us or at us to take responsibility. And it's crucial therefore to analyze ethics, care and responsibility in a manner that is inclusive of both human deliberation and these non-human entanglements. Okay, so this ethics of care is in close alignment with the goals of existential media studies and its practices of careful listening, wrapping around and curating, but it, uh, while also, of course, keeping a proper distance. Um, but it also pertains to time. Or maybe this is something I would like to discuss with you. Uh, in uh, in uh, the anesthetics of existence, essays on experience uh, at the edge. The feminist philosopher Cressida J. Hayes argues for bringing back in limit experiences of the edge, which are ex excluded often from life and too often also from scholarly attention. And she exemplifies her point with sexual violence, childbirth and drug use. And I also suggest that my morning informants and especially the bereaved parents uh, are a margin often without a name in our society in the sense that they represent the unspeakable. Uh, they also belong to these um, experiences um, at the edge. Um, the limit situation therefore constitutes the kind of semantic void uh, and often such experiences, as much as, much as pain it, and trauma, of course, itself, seem non-representable. And Hayes argues that a limit experience describes a unique, possibly entirely unexpected event that puts the self's account of itself into radical question, and in doing so, redraws at the bounds of its self-imagining. Because a limit experience is embodied and extra-linguistic, there is no method for approaching uh, it, not, nor any after the fact description that fully captures it. 
One can, however, describe the techniques that happen around limit experiences or that generate their conditions of possibility. Well, so in, in my study, I attended to a particular margin uh, because uh, being in bereavement in Swedish society is uh, a particular position where you is expected to deal with your grief uh, privately and uh, not make a fuss about it and you know get back on track as fast as possible become productive again um, and uh, the, in, in digital mourning the, those norms were overthrown or, or are overthrown um, but mourning here is in Sweden most of the time invisible and unwanted and unspeakable mourners say themselves and that our culture is plagued by a normativity culture of non-infliction um, but i hold along with jaspers that it's no doubt fruitless to try to you know aspire to any complete or comprehensive representation of experiences uh, in the limit situation but the limit situation is nevertheless a defining subjective reality rather than remaining hedged as i think chrisida hayes uh, is uh, by this foucauldian uh, idea of discourse that defines the conditions of possibility for our reality and for experience i think that what is needed is a different methodology for approximating these edge experiences through careful listening and slowing down so existential media studies calls for slowing down and claiming that there are innate deep-seated qualities that can only be learned and known through the pace and practices of careful listening and waiting in respectful acknowledgement of the other's inviolability. Hearing out voices that have been unheard is a key mission for all emancipatory projects, of course, and some margins have stronger political voices, others have weaker ones that require more attentive listening. And this also requires of the scholar the courage of, of listening and doing nothing. It turns the site of loss into a privileged site of, of alternative knowledge. And uh, yeah, I will skip this. Um, and this is at odds with digital time. Um, which uh, is, uh, I think, the temporal kind of order we live uh, by. Um, and it's related, of course, to a kind of hyper modern uh, form of disciplinary time, a uh, sense of techno scientific futurity, imperatives to always advance. Um, but digital time does more because it sets norms for accessibility and instant action. Uh, and, but it also presents us with a pace beyond our human. Uh, perception and beyond the human clock. Uh, it's tied to a world on and off speed, tied to progress and, as I said, and advancement. But it may also be tied to what Cressida Hayes calls post disciplinary time. Um, and I think this is interesting, and I'd like to discuss this with you. Because these temporalities exceed clock, the clock. Uh, and and um, uh, they also, um, they, they, they are of course of the absolute present. Everything is upgraded and updated constantly, right? Uh, in digital, uh, in the digital existence. And Hayes' account of, um, the, of our time is that we live in uh, what she calls post-disciplinary time. And it comprises of reconflations of work and life. We work every moment of multitasking and constant generalized anxiety about what may happen in the next moment. And she suggests that uh, post-disciplinary time should reconfigure how we think about agency even further away from an individual account that is premised on a temporally extended self and toward a much more skeptical analysis that recognizes the value of not doing. And she says that anesthetic time serves as a counterpoint to this contemporary existential situation. Uh, an aesthetic temporality quote is a sensical response to post-disciplinary time as a way of surviving in an economy of temporality that is relentlessly depleting, end of quote. 
now instead of surrendering, I think, to haze and aesthetic time, uh, I will argue that in order to bring about uh, what is needed is an existential ethics of care, we need perhaps existential time or enter into it. Um, this approach uh, implies active passivity. And I have tried in my work to enact this ethical rhythm in balancing um, closeness and respectful distance in my listening practices. This praxis itself taught me new and profound things about life and research, highlighting the combination of the meaning of phronesis as the capac capacity and virtue of reflective ethical judgment, as well as practical uh, wisdom itself. Uh, this led me in turn to formulate different ways of figurating digital existence and media life from the vantage point of these beings in distress. Yes, so here's anesthetics. Um, and importantly then, learning from mourners and online mourners who lost everything and placing them centrally for media studies uh, forges uh, an art of practical wisdom of carefully attending, waiting and listening. Um, and waiting, uh, according to Koshravi Shraharam in his in interesting book, Waiting a Project in Conversation, is that the word is derived from the words to watch and to be awake. Waiting engenders wakefulness and vigilance. Waiting is being in a state of consciousness. The person in a state of waiting constantly thinks about her or his waiting. Waiting means constantly updating oneself about the social and political condition waiting has imposed on her or him. Wakefulness makes waiting similar to insomnia, that is a compulsion to be vigilant and pay attention to what is happening around oneself. Similar to the one who waits, the insomniac thinks about the reasons for her insomnia and seeks relief from it. This aspect of waiting is even more palpable in the French verb attendre, which means to direct one's mind toward. A waiting towards is not, uh, waiting towards the not yet is attentive and oriented. In existentialist terms, waiting also has another timber or tenor. Here lies certain values and assets or resources also for change and hope and a potential for particular forms of creativity. Um, so waiting is in affinity with also uncertainty and with particular forms of care ethics. Um, it's convivial with slowing down, wrapping around and taking the time. So I will wrap this up now. I think I'm over time. Um, so my book takes the position then of one margin and revisits the concerns of existentialism while also at the same time jeopardizing the intellectual infrastructures of some quarters of media studies and their normalcies of speed. This means it interrogates the ethos of the discipline in the process and challenges some of its norms and epistemic foundations. This requires of us that we ask ourselves again, uh, as uh, Sam Mickey does in his wonderful book, Coexistentialism, he, he puts his either or like this. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be in a state of narcosis, deluded and passionless, anesthetized by formulas and certainties? Or would you rather be in a state of emergency, vulnerable to the extreme urgency of passion, exposed to the unpredictable ex exigencies of the world, end of quote. Um, I think that this speaks to uh, the project very well. And I think existential media studies then in closing appreciates that some forms of knowledge production will not only benefit uh, from slowing down, it actually requires of us that we embrace the rhythms of life within limits and that we work and write, philosophize and live and act and are idle in full acknowledgement of our own limits and of our responsibilities. And moving in this way across the edge of some of the ideals that currently shape disciplinary practice, not only, I guess, in media and communication studies, but in many other uh, disciplines too, this is uh, an act in deep alignment with the history of existentialist praxis, um, which uh, pertains to uh, the act of rebellion. So I have proposed an existential ethics of slowness, silence and waiting 
and carefully attending. Um, to develop an existential ethics of care, we, all, we need to overturn the tyranny of speed and mindless quantification, ideals of limitlessness, also in our own midst. And I argue this is not a scholastic exercise or something that applies to the practices and, or faults of someone else. Uh, it's instead a very task ahead in order for the humanities and social sciences to move out to confront uh, the challenges situated at the forefront of the digital limit situation. I think I'll stop there. I think I'm over time. <laughs>